I'd like to welcome you to the Australian Centre on China and the World. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Benjamin Penny. I'm the director of the centre. And first, as is customary, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and to uh, pay respects to their elders past and present. Um, tonight is a very auspicious occasion. As you know, the Morrison Lecture is uh, one of the university's, well, in fact, the, uni the university's oldest continuous public lecture, and indeed one of the oldest continuous public lectures in the world, especially in any field to do with Asia. The Morrison Lecture predates the ANU. The first was given in 1932 in Canberra, in the building that was then known as the Institute of Anatomy, for those of you who are old enough and Canberra resident long enough to know where that was, now the so-called National Film and Sound Archive. But for those of us of a certain age, it's, um, it's where Farlap's heart resided. Um, that's where it was given in the old days. Um, there were nine lectures given after, after and including 1932. Uh, it stopped in 1941 with the Second World War. Um, when the ANU was founded after the war, the Morrison Lecture was also refounded and started again in 1948, and it has been given every year since. Um, it is officially the Morrison Lecture in Ethnology, and it was originally funded by the Chinese community of Canberra. For those of you who are interested in the history of the Morrison Lecture, our journal East Asian History um, presented reprinted the first eight of the nine first lectures before the war um, a few years ago with a, a short essay introducing the early history of the Morrison Lecture. The one that we didn't print is because it was not available. We would have printed it otherwise. And some other selections of the Morrison Lecture post-war were printed in an earlier edition of East Asian History. Um, it's a very notable uh, lecture. Um, I'm so pleased that it's continuing. It is uh, run, run by a three-person committee, um, which at the moment consists of Professor Andrew Kipnis, Dr. Mark Strange and myself, and rotates amongst us as, as the kind of uh, primary chooser of, of the person. Um, um, I'll introduce Mark in a moment, who will introduce our speaker tonight, but I have to say that I'm really pleased that Professor Kane has agreed to give tonight's lecture. Danny is one of the um, great scholars of the Chinese world that Australia has produced, a great linguist, a great historian, um, and a lovely man as well. Um, I think it's very appropriate that he's put up this first slide. Um, that um, you probably recognize that that is Danny um, <laughs> a, a few years ago now but um, you know it, it's great to see that he's been you know rendered immortal in artistic works as well um, that's all I'll say for the moment uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Mark Strange who is currently uh, on secondment here in the Australian Centre on China and the World normally found in the School of Culture History and Language and one of our great historians of pre-modern China, continuing in the tradition that this university has always had to study um, the, the pre-modern era uh, of Chinese history. We take it seriously, and Mark is the latest, one of the latest incarnations of that serious intent. So very appropriate person to introduce, Danny. Uh, that was a slightly overblown introduction when I was uh, <laughs> sitting next to tonight's speaker, but uh, there you go. Anyway, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this year's uh, George E. Morrison lecture. My name, is, as Ben has already said, is Mark Strange. I'm a member of the uh, ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and again, with, with Ben and with uh, Andrew Kipnis, I'm uh, honoured to be a member of the um, organising committee uh, for the lecture series, and it's in that capacity that I'm, I'm making this introduction tonight. So as Ben has already explained, um, this is the, I don't, did you mention it? It's the 78th 
well, for those of you who can do the maths, it's going to be straightforward. It's the 78th contribution um, to this extremely prestigious and long-running annual lecture series, the George E. Morrison Lecture uh, in Ethnology. And the association with uh, George Morrison points up um, a particular concern with China, but actually I'm more interested in uh, dwelling briefly uh, in this introduction on the other part of the title, on the focus um, on ethnology. Uh, it's quite a long way from uh, where I normally stand, but I think, by my understanding, ethnology is the, uh, is the study, um, the comparative study of cultures of different peoples, and as a corollary of uh, cultural contact, please correct me if, if that's a misapprehension, um, but if that is right, then I think the topic of uh, tonight's lecture, um, an attempt to understand the Kitan people, who I'll return to in a second, uh, in their own language, um, is, uh, uh, strikes me as, as more than usually relevant to um, the foundational principles of this particular lecture series with that focus on, um, on ethnology. Um, and actually, I suppose we could say that ethnology runs right through this evening from the, uh, from the um, acknowledgement of country right through to the topic of the lecture. As we will no doubt hear in what follows, the Kitan people um, inhabited, uh, well, they came from obscure origins, but they inhabited areas of Northeast Asia um, from about the fourth century through to um, the 13th century. Uh, they founded the state of Liao, uh, in the early 10th century, and this was a polity um, that exerted um, a formative influence on successive Han Chinese uh, states. Um, but it's only really in recent years that the extent of Kitan uh, influence on their Han Chinese neighbors has really started to receive its uh, due acknowledgement, has been recognized in scholarship um, for how important it really was. Uh, and tonight's speaker has been at the forefront of Anglophone efforts uh, in that direction, as in Anglophone contributions to that vital, I think, vital <coughs> scholarly endeavor um, to better understand the Chinese world by understanding the world of its neighbors. So for the past uh, several decades, um, Danny Kane has been a leading authority on the Kitan language, uh, as well as on the language of another rival to uh, medieval Han Chinese polities, the Jurchens. He originally comes from uh, Melbourne, but he took his PhD at the ANU in 1975 uh, with a thesis on Jurchen language um, of the uh, 12th and 13th century Jin state. That research then became uh, the basis of his 1989 uh, monograph, the sino jurchen vocabulary of the Bureau of Interpreters. Uh, I hear that his first acquaintance uh, with Kitan goes back to 1970, um, but his book on the language uh, and script uh, of, of Kitan, published by Brill in 2009, uh, is without doubt the standard uh, English language work on that subject. Uh, it was described by one reviewer as, quote, a significant step forwards towards the goal of deciphering the Kitan language, which the same reviewer suggested, quote, among all the undeciphered languages is probably the one which has the greater chance of what being one day fully understood. That raised a slight smile in the, in the light of um, the, the abstract that Danny supplied us, so I hope that tonight's lecture may serve to put those remarks into their full and, uh, and proper context. Also on the study of languages past and present, um, Professor Kane has written an introductory work on the history and usages uh, of the Chinese language. And it's with those research interests that he has held academic posts at the uh, University of Melbourne, uh, at Peking University, and um, he was professor of Chinese at Macquarie University from 1997 uh, until his retirement. Uh, but Danny Kane's interests have also uh, long extended um, beyond the languages and cultures of those uh, medieval peoples. Uh, for example, he's published several articles on the late Korean imperial states' uh, variegated engagement with the international community in the 19th and into the very early 20th centuries. Um, and Ben rightly pointed out today, there's also another kind of pertinent link. The uh, 19th um, National Congress of the CCP opened in Beijing yesterday, as many of you will know. And in the context of that event of uh, crucial significance um, for the future composition of the CCP, but also the future direction of its, of its uh, policies. Uh, it might be worth noting that, uh, noting Professor Kane's 
contribution to a 1993 edited volume. It was called uh, Modernization of the Chinese Past. The volume was called Modernization of the Chinese Past. Um, but his paper traced, and to use its title, irrational belief among the Chinese elite. So we have the full spectrum from the medieval to the absolutely contemporary and relevant. His observations in that paper, incidentally, and much else besides, I suspect, were based on a parallel career in diplomacy. Um, he joined the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs shortly after completing his PhD uh, in, uh, in 19, 1975. Uh, he was posted to Beijing in 1976. And later on, he was also a cultural counselor at the Australian Embassy in Beijing in the mid-1990s. So it's with that um, extraordinary combination of uh, technical expertise um, and intellectual breadth in mind um, that I'd like to welcome this year's uh, Morrison lecture, uh, lecturer, uh, Daniel Kane, to uh, guide us through some attempts to decipher the Kitan language uh, and by so doing to add to our understanding of uh, the ethnology of the Chinese world and that of its neighbors. After that, what can I say? We may as well go home and talk about the good old days. Uh, the first few slides I prepared here, I didn't quite know how it was going to pan out tonight. So these are just sort of to kill time while we get ourselves organized and, and so on and so on. So I just uh, mentioned this fellow is the guy that I call the new boss. So if you turn up on Monday morning and say, guess what, we've got a new boss, and this guy turns up, you know he is saying, don't, don't mess with me. You know, he's a very, actually it's a, uh, uh, a death mask of some important official. Um, this is just a very outline map. The Liao capital city, which is, don't worry too much about it, but it's, in a, it's very close to a place called Chifeng in modern China, it's about two hours drive away. The, down there somewhere you can find a Nan, Nanjing. Nanjing is what we now call the, um, the, the basis, more or less the same place as Beijing. Beijing. Uh, so it's a fairly big, um, a very big territory. This one, one of my friends didn't like it very much, but I put it there anyway, uh, because it shows you that really it was a quite a huge territory. There's the CCI, there's the, the Song Dynasty, so and so, and there is the Liao Dynasty. Now the Liao were a very particular, a very strange lot. Um, they started off, uh, as Mark was saying, uh, they established a dynasty, but they first called themselves the Great Kitan State. And then after 50 years or so, they changed their name to the Great Liao Dynasty. Nobody knows why. And then after another 50 years, they changed their name again, to the Great Kitan State again. And then another 50 years time, they changed their name back again. This has not happened any time in Chinese history, and nobody knows why. Why they had this urge to go and change their, their, their name every now and then. This is just a tomb a mule of what they look like with uh, his boots, his, his clothes and whatnot. Like I said, they were just a few very introductory um, slides to uh, uh, before we, we start the lecture as such. Okay, I just got a couple of quotations here which is quite, well I think they're relevant. The Cybermans are by far the most glamorous achievements of scholarship. There is a touch of magic about unknown writing. Morris Pope with the story of the decipherment. The decipherment of a newly discovered or perennially mysterious text is the most glamorous aspect of the study of writing systems, Daniels and Bright. Now, I don't know if everybody in this room would agree that the discovery of the decipherment of dead languages is the most exciting thing you can imagine. Probably nobody would, and certainly it's a, it's a minority view. But for people who get into this sort of stuff, it really is a extremely uh, attractive and uh, extremely, what would I say, uh, uh, not exactly glamorous, not sort of word, but something you can't put down. Once you've got hooked on it, you, you stay hooked for a long time. Uh, I might just mention, by the way, when Mark was talking about, I should pay tribute to all my various teachers and whatnot, but in particular, Igor de Rakobeltz, who died about a year ago, slightly less than a year ago, um, that when I was doing a PhD ages ago, we started talking about Etruscan, and he said, oh, if you're interested in Etruscan and Chinese, you might read this book by Witt Vogel and Fung on the history of the 
Chinese society of the hour. And so I did, and then I was more or less hooked because here was an undeciphered language that you more or less had to know about China and Chinese to, to get some sort of grasp of. So if we look particularly at the Kitan script, sometimes people write with a KH and sometimes with a K, by the way. KH is sort of considered a bit old-fashioned now, sort of like Beijing and Peking, so it doesn't, it's the same place, it's different spelling. It is still a long way to the heart of the jungle of the Kitan writing system. Um, the writing, the Kitan script remains one of the most fascinating problems in the history of the Altaic world, and much hard work remains to be done before we shall be able to read, for instance, the Kitan rhymes in memory of Emperor Xuanyi, the poetess who was put to death 911 years ago. Kara, who was a Hungarian expert on Mongolian and Turkish and so on, 1987. Now, I particularly wanted to use that quotation because in the book I wrote, of which I have a copy here, I transcribed that particular inscription. So even though we're not on top of it, we're more on top of it than we used to be. Um, but I'll explain what I mean later. That uh, uh, Yes, the next quotation is probably the most appropriate of all. Even such a famous grammatologist as Nishida Tatsuo, who was a, obviously a Japanese expert, could only sigh. To tell you the truth, the Kitan script is becoming more and more incomprehensible. Things which we were able to understand before, we are even less able to understand now. So it's like a cryptic crossword puddle up until people, you know, you think you've got that corner right, but then something goes wrong and the whole thing is back to square one again. And a lot of attempts to, to decipher Kitan are very much of that, of that type. Okay, um, this is uh, Great Minds Think Alike. This is a quotation from Jürgen Janthornen, who mentioned about the possibility of full decipherment. The Kitan script remains one of the most crucial unsolved problems of comparative Mongolian studies. It is also one of the, which is born by my interest, it is also one of the last remaining scripts in the world for which the prospects of full decipherment are good. So everybody knows that the Phaistos disk which nobody can read and there's the Indus Valley script which nobody can read and, and so on and so on. But for various reasons it's very unlikely that those scripts are ever going to be read unless something really turns up, some sort of a bilingual or some sort of a dictionary or something like that. But at the moment, Kitan looks as if it could be and should be able to be deciphered. So it's just a matter of going to this and keep working on it until something appears. Um, what we find when we look at other famous decipherments of ancient Egyptian, of Champollion, for example, Old Persian, Linear B and Ventress, ancient Greek, man, you know, I think a lot of people know about these things, were undeciphered languages which various geniuses sorted out of the seemingly incomprehensible mess. And they worked out there's a sort of pattern going on there. And when it's all sorted out, it turns out that in each and every one of these cases, it is related to a language which is known. So ancient Egyptian was related to Coptic. The Mayan script was related to modern Mayan sort of languages. Uh, Old Persian was obviously related to later versions of Persian and so on and so on. Now, if you don't have that underlying language, you're really in trouble. So do we have an underlying language in the case of Kitan? Well, that is one of the major questions. Kitan, and unless one takes it for granted that the language is Mongolian. So I wouldn't say everybody, but 90% of people who work on this presume that Kitan is a form of Mongolian. The problem is that you've got to prove these things. And when you apply, when you try to read a, a Mongolian inscription, having a, you know, just a, a dictionary in your hand, you can't make any sense of, of Kitan only using Mongolian. It seems to me, well, not only seems to me, I put forward this, this view and then people say, mm, yeah, yeah, you're Dali. Um, so uh, the Finnish guy I mentioned before, he's very good at thinking of possible hypotheses. So he came up with the idea of what he calls paramongolic. And paramongolic, according to his, this is purely a hypothesis, no proof of this, um, but that before Genghis Khan and the Mongol, the Pax Mongolic, as we were talking about before, um, before Genghis Khan there were a lot of tribes, peoples, Minzu in that area 
who spoke languages which, which were in some ways sort of a bit like Mongolian, which had been wiped out in due course and which had been assimilated by Mongolian or what have you. But there's still um, some traces of Mongolian inside Khitan. So when people say, aha, inside, you know, in the Khitan language, there's this uh, section looks a bit like Mongolian, that section looks like a bit like Mongolian. That's where they get from. But still, you have to prove it. Um, but that's the concept of power Mongolian. Now we get onto the more interesting part. Most of you tonight, well, many of you tonight, I should have said, have been to, to Xi'an and you've been to the tomb of Emperor's Wu. And either your guidebook or your guide or what have you will take you to this very famous inscription, which is called the Steely Without an Inscription. A Steely is a, a, a huge rock a huge stone on which an inscription is, is written. But this one doesn't have an inscription on it. And this had to do with Empress Wu's view, because she was a sort of a Buddhist, was that by writing down a list of her achievements, that limits them. And so by writing something down, you are saying, you are putting a limit to what she did. So if you write nothing, you're not putting any limit there. So her achievements are limitless. <coughs> but if you happen to be there on maybe on a particularly auspicious occasion, you'll see that it, in fact there was a black blob there, which you normally would well you would normally would just look and say, oh yeah, you know, it's a bad, that's it, and move on. But if you are rather interested, you might want to know what is this black blob, and why did somebody get up and put it there? Um, what it is, and you can't see it from the ground, of course, because it's too far up, it's about three metres above the, above the ground. Um, but if you happen to have a telescope or, you know, binoculars, if you happen to be walking around China with a telescope, um, you can sort of vaguely work it out, but it's not a very good way of doing it. Well, this is indeed what the black blob is. And as you can see, the black, this is the so-called rubbing. And so somebody actually had to physically climb up the rock with some sort of scaffolding and with black, with black ink and with a little hammer, you know, pop, 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 until you eventually get a reproduction of what is on it. And as you can see, and I've got a, a slide there too, the thing at the top, don't worry too much about that, that's just the Chinese um, seal script. But underneath that, there's something incomprehensible followed by something written in classical Chinese. Now this is the Rosetta Stone of Kidan studies. And why do we call it the Rosetta Stone? Because the Rosetta Stone, of course, was the key to understanding um, ancient Egyptian. And Shaponi, I sort of worked it out. Uh, and what it is, I'll see if we can get a better shot of it. Yes, that's it. That's what it looks like. Um, and that's a rubbing, and that's essentially, you know, what I just showed you, except it's much bigger and clearer. So here we have something very strange. Well, well, not very strange, but very particular, because if we read the Chinese, as we're doing to English, or if we translate it into English, which was done in recent times, the first translation was in 1860 by a missionary sinologist called Wiley. Um, so you know what the Chinese means if you are Chinese. If you're not a Chinese, somebody will translate it for you and you know what it means. And it even says there somewhere towards the end, um, this is a translation, that's a Chinese version, this is a translation of what is on the right. So in other words, this is on the right, and whatever it is, it's, this is a Chinese translation. So this is a bilingual, you know, heaven's gift to every this, this would be decipherer. And so all you then have to do is to work out, you know, um, what corresponds to what, and you've done it. Except that's not the way it's worked out, but I'll tell you how it was worked out. And what we're going to do tonight, whatever else we do is another matter, that we're going to read this. So this is our text for tonight. And at, you know, at the beginning of the evening, which was 20 minutes ago, um, none of us heard of it mainly, or held it upside down, or did something like that. But I shall show you how we have been able to manage to work out 
what that means and why it means what it means. And then, of course, it's a matter of expanding that knowledge to other um, inscriptions because there are about 30 inscriptions in this sort of writing, which is known as the Ketan small script. Okay, so here we, here we go. In front of the tomb of Empress Wu, we just said that. It is a bilingual in Ketan and Chinese, and this is what it says. Okay, I've got the Chinese version, but it's coming up later. The younger brother of the great Jin state, now, question number one, the great Jin state implies that this is Zhuqian, it's the Jin dynasty. And so that misled people for a good century or so because they thought it was the Zhuqian language they were reading, but actually it was quite a different language. Um, okay, so there he is, the, the, the younger brother of the, uh, the great Jin state. Um, campaign commander, which is a title, military commissioner, court attendant, all titles. But sometimes in the border area there were no matters to attend to. So he was in charge of a particular area, nothing much going on, he was a bit bored. So he went hunting to the south side of Yangshan Mountain. So that's all very clear. When he arrived at the Chending Tombs of the Tang, which is where Empress Wolves Tomb and rather related tombs nearby, the halls and corridors were in a state of decay. There was nothing to be seen. He ordered issues to the authorities to gather workmen to make repairs. And this is very easy to, to imagine. You know, here comes the emperor's brother, turns up, the whole place is in a god-awful mess. He calls the local magistrate and he says, fix it up. You know, this is disgusting. And so the magistrate says, ah, so, 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 so. And, you know, he said, I'll be back. And, uh, and he, he did, he came back later. And now he returned um, to visit the tombs. The paintings were like new. Surrounding corridors were on all four sides. He was inexpressibly delighted. Maybe he was an Australian. Afterwards, he drank wine with the prefect of Lia and returned home. So, you know, they had a bit of a, bit of a drink. And then he went home again. So that's what it means. We thought, well, we're getting somewhere because, you know, there's the Kitan, there's the English. The question is, what part of the English corresponds to what part of the Kitan or vice versa? And then it's got the date at the end. The date was the 12th year of the Tianhui period, 1134, midwinter, the 14th day. Court minister, director, more, more official titles. Operations, Huang Yingqi, the prefect of Yojo, Wang Gui, wrote this in accordance with the edict. On the right, it's a translation of the text, which I mentioned before. It tells you in plain Chinese that, you know, this is a translation. Okay, so if we... Um, Look at a Kitan translation of it. I'll see how long this goes. Yeah, it's better to, to have a quick look at this because it's all in Chinese, so I won't do too much about it. But here we have Dajin Huang Di Ju Tong Jing Le. This is an official title, OT official title, PM place name, PM place name, PM place, should we PM place name, OT official title. So all these T, TWs and NUMs and whatnot. They're, they're like little arrows. This is an official title, Governor General. This is an official title, you know, Rear Admiral, or whatever it, it, it may be. So when you are looking for a, a, little, a, little, a, little, a little gap, something which you can start working on, a good place to start is... Let um, me go back here. A good place to start is place names or personal names or something like that, because they tend to be, you know, written in, well, the Chinese names are written in Ketan script, and they sell a Chinese place name. So when you are sort of hanging this up on your wall, I've also got a hanging there, and anybody's very welcome to come and have a look at them later. You spend, you just seem to spend an awful lot of time looking at the wall when you do Ketan studies. You just sort of sit there, far day, you know, <laughs> waiting for inspiration to strike. Uh, and, Occasionally it does, but anyway, when you reconstruct at Woods Bay, you've got great and gold, and then this is after the job has already been done. Go and Kahan, go and now Liao Yishadi. Basically, if we start off in the very beginning, we can see what did this guy do? He was bored, he went out to hunt, where did he go to hunt? Liao Shan. What letter of the alphabet does Liao Shan start with? L, or La in Chinese. 
And then we, we look later in the tomb, in the, in the inscription, which I'll uh, show you in a minute, we see that he um, had a drink at the, the, the magistrate of Lijo, that also is a place name which begins with L. And lo and behold, you've got the same sort of letter there. So you say, let us have a hypothesis that this is L. And so you go scrounging in the uh, inscription looking for another L, and you find Tian, Tang Qianling, the Qianling tombs of the Tang Dynasty. A Ling tomb could be considered a place name, and it ends in, it starts with L, and the next syllable is Ying. Mm, that's interesting, because the name of the official who wrote this thing at the end was called Huang Ying Shi, and lo and behold, it's written Ying, which is the same Ying in there. So you, that confirms that you've got an Ying up there. Quick, quick question. Yes. <laughs> how, to, how to get this working again? <laughs> Ah, 1115 it started. And 1115 it started. Okay, so now the reason, the reason for this is, that's a, of yeah, and that, that's a very interesting question and it's, it's, a, it's not complicated but it's just a little bit deeper. What's going on here? And what is going on in fact is that people still preferred to write in Ketan and in the Ketan script even though it was a Jin dynasty. That the, the Jurchens had their own script but it was very rarely used and the Jurchen upper classes had been educated in Kitan. And so when they wanted to take to poetry or something, they did it in Kitan. So even though this was during the Jin dynasty, which was run by the Jurchens, it's sort of like in English, for example, people might put up a sign, well, 50 years ago, people might put up a sign in Latin just because it looks better. It doesn't mean to say that, you know, we're still in the Roman Empire. Um, but that, that is basically, yeah, very, very sharp because People, and that was what confused people for so long. Because they thought it was Jurchen. And there was no way, and seeing we've got a bit of time which is not related to this. Just to finish off that story, by the way, people thought it was in Jurchen until a Belgian priest, um, this is a story of skullduggery, so I won't go into it at the moment unless we have time later. But anyway, he happened to be nearby when peasants um, stole or excavated the tomb of the Xingzheng Emperor in 1923 when northern China was in absolute chaos. And when he excavated it, it was clearly a, a Kita thing, and then people realized, aha, this is the same script as the Woods of Bay script in, in Xi'an, therefore it's not Jurchen after all, it's really Kita. And that had certain important consequences. Okay, we can get back to where we, we were. This is probably something like it sounded, or what it was when we work it out. Why do I do great gold? Because, in capital letters, because we know what these words mean, but we don't know how they were pronounced. Okay. Now some people would say, oh, well, we'll call this Ihe, or we'll call it Ihe, or we'll call it Yeke, or we'll call it something Mongolian looking. But there's no evidence at all that the word for great um, had anything to do with the Mongolian word for, for great, or that the Kitan word for gold. But you know it means gold because it says Da, Da Jin Huang Di, you know, the great gold empire. This means because in his region there was nothing going on, at the Liangshan, at the side of it, he went hunting. And then, so there should be a, oh, never mind, there should be a, uh, that doesn't work. Anyway, he went hunting, and um, then uh, things were in a, he discovered that things were in the, the, an awful mess, so he called together the NIDA, the heads, uh, who were local, locally there, and told them to clean it up. And you can get the general idea. Then he came back later, and everything was like new, and therefore with the heads he drank some wine, and then he went back home again. At that time it was heaven on the 10th, 2nd, 4th day it happened in the year of the tiger, uh, I was a year, a year of the tiger in middle um, winter on the 10th, on the 14th day it was. So even after 10 minutes or so, we've got a general idea of what this was all about. 
and we haven't quite finished there. This is just the same sort of thing, but noting what are the official titles and, and so on. This is a Kitan text idea. You see, great god, Guren, which probably is, or almost certainly is a word for state, the great Jin state, Khan. Because the word obviously meant, you know, he was a younger brother of the emperor. But if you're an emperor, you could be a Huangdi or you could be a Khan, you could be a Khan. And so people just didn't know which one it was and spent many years trying to work out. But eventually they worked out it really was Khan. And then Chao Jihu is another one because it's a Chinese title, which means Minister of War or something like this. But it didn't look like anything in Chinese. It wasn't until, again, a lot of hard work that people worked out that Chao Ji meant war and Hu means in charge of, in charge of war. King Liao is another official title. Shari, which is an, a, 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 a Kitan word meaning uh, they call it a, a, court, a court attendant, somebody who would have various official duties in the court because in the region and so on. So this, um, we don't have to read it, but you can see the same sort of thing. You see, here's NIDA again, the heads of the thing, and here's the date, and here's the, the tiger, and here is uh, the mid, middle, and this is winter, and this is four day, and it goes on and on. So that is essentially a transcription, a translation of that particular um, inscription. Once you get your head around that, of course, you can start going in different directions because you say, okay, we know that the word for official in charge is NIDA, the heads. We, we talk to the you know, heads, meaning boss. Um, but then if you look at other inscriptions, because there are about 30 odd inscriptions in this language, and you say, oh, look, there it is. Here's, here's the word which means uh, to be in charge of something. And then what happens next? Oh, look, here's the word for war. Now, what's going on here? And so you can expand. You know, you, you, you started, you've got a little bit of a grasp of what's going on. And the more then you move into other... Practically now, whenever people discover a, um, a, uh, an inscription, uh, they find something new, you know, that you know, maybe it's only one thing, maybe it's more than one thing. But there's a little bit of progress every time, except the progress is very, very small. Now, this particular type of script that we've been looking at is called the Ketan Small Script. And why is it called the Ketan Small Script, you may ask? Because the Ketans also had two of, not only two, or Ha, two um, reign titles, but they had two sort of scripts. And this is really very strange, because why would anybody invent two scripts? So I've got a little quotation here when we look at the last script, but basically, when the emperor came to... I think he'd been on the throne for 10 years or something. And he, um, he called together, or he ordered a, a group of Chinese, literate Chinese, to create a script for the Kitan language. And so the Chinese took Chinese characters and took them apart and re-put them back together again. And you see sometimes some modern Chinese poets do this sort of thing. They get a, you know, characters and they sort of have you know, different radicals and different phonetics and they... Anyway, the Ketans were doing it a thousand, a thousand years ago. But then according to the story in the history of the Liao Dynasty, and one had to be very careful of the history of the Liao Dynasty because it was compiled 200 years after the fall of the Liao. And also it was based on practically no material. So often people say, oh, according to the Liao Dynasty, such and such, except you have to be very careful when you're using the Liao Dynasty. But getting back for a minute to the, 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 the second script, they have already had a script. Then five years later, if we are to believe the Liao history, here we have this, um, uh, what do you call it, this uh, inscription. Uyghur messages came to the court, but there was no one who could understand their language. The emperor said to Tia Taizu, Tia La, who was his brother, was he's clever. He may be sent to welcome them. By being in their company for 20 days, he may be able to learn their spoken language and script. I repeat, he was with them for 20 days and he learned their spoken language and script. Eat your hearts out, would be, <laughs> would be modern scholars of obscure languages. Like, like Tolkien, perhaps. Well, like Tolkien, there's, a, there's a, a great quotation about Pelio, 
It wasn't meant to be funny, but I found it funny. That when he was out looting, you know, doing huang and so on, uh, he got caught in Kashgar or something like that uh, because his luggage was somewhere. And so in his obituary or what have you, it said, uh, um, Pelio learned Kashgari, Turkic, while he was waiting for his luggage. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got 20 minutes. <laughs> so you have these wonderful stories about, uh, about linguists. He then created a number of smaller Ketan characters, which although fewer in number, fewer in number, or few in number, covered everything. Generally accepted date 925, that is, if we are to believe this, just five years later. But it is more than a century before the earliest extant inscription. So in other words, we've got a story that in 925, he went and learned Uyghur in 20 days. Sounds like one of these books you buy in the foreign language bookshop, hasn't it? You know, Manx in a month, or Welsh in a week, or Uyghur in a fortnight, or whatever it was. Um, so there's some sort of a problem going on here, because the question is, why would they do it? If you've already got a script, but then somebody comes along with a much easier script, why would you want to keep two of them? One would normally think that you'd use the simpler script, which has about 400, or some, probably somewhat less, about 380 characters in, because it's very easy to learn, well, comparatively speaking, and it's very easy to write, and so on and so on. But the, Chinese, but the Kidans still maintained the earlier script and used both of them. So in the tombs, right throughout the dynasty, right to the end of the dynasty, they used both scripts. And I'll give you an example of what both scripts look like. And you'll see they don't really look anything like each other. Oh, they all look vaguely Chinese, but um, they're very... Uh... OK, this is very elegant. Just a, an example of something to say. This is in the Chiquitan small script, a bronze mirror. And you can see it's really terribly elegant sort of script and was written normally in this sort of quasi sing sort of um, type of the first imperial script. Ah yes, this is the one I was uh, telling you, uh, mentioning about the, the uh, discovery of, at one time this was the only in inscription that people had of any sort of Kitan. Then this priest came along and he found one um, inscription at the bottom of a of a, a grave, and the reason the peasants hadn't stolen it was too bloody heavy. <laughs> but you know they whacked off everything they could find, but you know a couple of tons of stuff in some language nobody could read was hardly worth the, the trouble. Anyway, he turned up with a whole lot of people who had who made a uh, and he had them dangling by ropes over the the grave, which was a couple of meters down. And none of them knew how to make rubbing, so they had to copy it. And all of you, of course, have tried to copy things in languages which you don't know very well, so you tend to get them wrong. And anyway, it got wrong, but then, I, but it was something at least. And then afterwards, the son of a, a sort of a warlord, a military commissioner or something, uh, also looted um, some royal tombs and put them in his garden, sort of like garden gnomes or something like this. <laughs> Um, but they eventually found their way into museums and so on in China. So by the uh, 30s, no, by the 40s, shall we say, 40s, 50s, uh, the Chinese had five fairly substantial inscriptions. That's the two for the emperors in English, and, and not in English, in Chinese and Kita, and two others for the emperors and this one. Now, there's something which I wasn't going to um, mention, but one of my friends who was looking at this said, oh, you know, a bit of um, historical, uh, what, human sort of, uh, um, what would I say, addition, because, well, addition to this, because there was a good deal of bad blood going on between this particular priest and another priest, and then this one bought this, but then he sold it to somebody else, and it went on and on. But there's something else which is really quite interesting about the Cultural Revolution. Everybody says Cultural Revolution, dreadful, dreadful. Uh, but it did have its rather interesting aspects. And one was, towards the end of the Cultural Revolution, there was uh, the intellectuals or officials were sent to the countryside, 
to learn from the peasants and so on and so on. So they basically had nothing to do. So three people in Inner Mongolia and two people in Peking used their time to make up little slips of the Kitan, the Kitan inscriptions. So slips are what they are, they're sort of bits of paper. So you would say, you know, there's this, there was this particular Kitan letter and it appears, you know, before this one and after that one and blah, blah, blah. And this took something like three or four years. Nowadays it would take a computer, you know, three minutes or something. Um, but this is how they started doing it because they had nothing to do except amuse themselves with the Kitan scripts where the Cultural Revolution had certain <laughs> advantages <laughs> um, uh, for them. Anyway, when they... Um, after the Cultural Revolution, in those days it was a bit complicated because you may remember those of you who were around at the time, was that everything was um, done collectively. So if this was written by ABCDE, it was say it was written by so and so collectively. So you're never quite sure who had done what. He said, now you can work out because people were writing their memoirs and so on and so on. In any case, in 1985 was a second major breakthrough in, in the Kitan script, which is in um, there. A reconstruction grid of the Kitan syllables. Now this is quite interesting, something I, I found that when you're looking at a syllabic script, because we didn't have time to go into it, but this is not an alphabetic script, it's syllabic. You know, I, or or whatever it is. Now I'm pretty sure that if you look at Ventris and the disciple of Linear B, uh, you find that he invented the idea of a, a grid for himself. I'm pretty sure he didn't know anything about Japanese. Uh, but grids are really quite important for this sort of language. And I think, I hope, the next one, yeah. I didn't write this, somebody copied something that I did, but it doesn't matter. Um, you can see there's I, A, E, O, 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 so you've got three O's and three U's. And here you've got I, A, O, 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 O. But here you've got four missing, and here you've got six missing, but here you've got a certain number missing. Now what you would expect, um, of what the, the uh, linguists used to call uh, comparative, what was it called? Comparative something. Um, that all of these should be have something written in them. So there are still quite a few characters that we don't know what they are, but there's a fair bit that they fit into one of these categories here, just that we haven't quite worked out what particular little hole, what particular little square there they're, they're into. Now, uh, this is from the um, tomb of the first emperor. And again, if you just look and say, oh yeah, Chinese. But then when you look at it, you say, well, yeah, sort of Chinese, but that's Zheng, or it appears to be Zheng. But this is what could be Zheng, and this looks like Xu, but it's missed something. And that looks like one, but with a big thing I want. This looks like Chun, but it doesn't have a line, so it has a whore. So all of it looks very much like Chinese characters, but different. So this is the large script. This is the script that the Chinese invented for them. They invented for the emperor. Uh, so I've just written here, this is a remnant of the last script. And now, of course, because of for different reasons, the Chinese government won't let the Chinese archaeological um, departments explore or open imperial tombs. So even though they can explore around the tombs, in front of the tombs, at the side of the tombs, peripheral tombs, all sorts of tombs. They can't actually get inside the imperial tombs themselves. So almost certainly inside the imperial tombs would be lots of other, um, lots of other uh, inscriptions written in Kitan, but we can't get hold of them at the moment, and they've tried all sorts of things to, to do it. Now, this is a much bigger example of the large script. And again, if we look at it, we say, oh, yeah, Chinese. But for those of you who know Chinese, you'll see that practically there are some things which look as if they might be Chinese or which are Chinese, but they don't make too much sense. So I, I can't push. But you can see them for yourself here. This one looks like Liang, meaning two, but it doesn't have the line at the top. This one, we don't know what it is. This one means country, but it doesn't have a little dot in it. This one is the one which we just saw. It looks like Chuntian, looks like the word for spring, except it's got a fire instead of a you know, the, the three lines again. The next one is something that looks like elder brother. 
even if you put all that together, it still doesn't make the slightest bit of sense. Um, so those of you who are Chinese, your first reaction is probably, oh, it's Chinese. But then you look at it more carefully and you say, huh? <laughs> and, uh, whatever it is, it's sort of pretty weird Chinese. And then the next thing you'll say, no, it's not Chinese, but it looks like Chinese. Anyway, that's a large script. And then this is the small script, which you can see is quite a different kettle of fish. This is a large script. Again, it sort of looks vaguely Chinese. But you can see that each character is made up of a certain number of smaller characters. So that one has got four, that one has got four, that one has got two, that one has got five, that one has got two, that one has got one, that one has got two. These are syllables. So in other words, a script is a syllabic script, which means that this is why it is much easier to work it out, because once you work out, like this is I, for example, which can either mean father or it can mean year. Um, once you work out a certain number of them, lots of things, it's, it's, it's sort of like um, inspired guesswork sometimes, you know, that he respected he something very much. What did he respect very much? Well, maybe it was his grandfather, maybe it was his uncle, maybe it was his emperor, but eventually you work out it meant his father. And so it's by this sort of um, guesswork, I suppose, that people... But uh, the, the whole point of this is to see that there are two quite distinct scripts. So if you look at the one first that I said, you know, the, the large script, it looks like Chinese. This also looks sort of like Chinese, but even less Chinese than the other one does. This one doesn't really look Chinese. And this one is supposed to be... The other story, by the way, about the... or the other problem, possibility, that according to this story about the guy learning Uyghur in, in 20 days, um, is all very well, except that no known script of the Uyghurs or anybody else looks anything like that. Uh, and the, the Uyghurs used to know four scripts, and the Uyghurs were sort of very literate people, and they knew Chinese, and they knew Arabic, and they knew all sorts of you know, varieties of Turkic and so on. Uh, but no, there are no, none of the scripts that the Uyghurs knew looked anything like that. So the question is, where did the script come from? Well, at the moment, the answer is nobody knows. Maybe somebody just made it up. Um, but it's one of, the big, one of the big questions we are waiting for. Moving on a little bit, because we're partly, partly time, but more because, you know, that's rather sort of abstract sort of stuff. This is quite interesting because, again, nobody knows what it is. Uh, people guess it's got something to do with uh, some sort of a funerary, you know, place where the emperor's coffin may have been laid until he was formally, um, uh, you know, buried in a proper tomb or what have you. But it's completely open. Anybody can go there and take their picture there and stand on top of it or do whatever they want. Um, uh, this is about the large states, the, the, so the large script. You see, civil, small and neighboring states have been subdued and an ex-employed many Chinese who taught them how to write by altering characters in the clerical script, adding there and cutting there, adding here and cutting there. They created a script of several thousand characters, replacing the contacts made on notches of wood. So they created a script of several thousand characters, the, the, the large script. Then along comes this prince and creates a script of about 400 characters. But what do the ketones do? They say, oh, well, that's very nice, but we'll still use the one with several thousand characters in, which is a bit hard to sort of fathom just what's going on. Okay, this was quite a big discovery um, quite recently, three or four years ago, of the large cursive script. If you think that these scripts are bad enough, at least they look as if they're legible. Um, this doesn't even look as if it's illegible. And the reason is because this is a cursive variety of the large, uh, the large script. And this was discovered by a young Russian who was an expert on the Cixia language. And people knew that there was a, a book that's about 200 and something pages long. There was a book in some language which nobody knew what it was, so they just put it in some pile of rubbish there. And then he was going through this pile of stuff and he sort of looked at it and he realised that the, the date on it was a Kitan date. That is, and he couldn't have discovered that, you know, five years earlier because we didn't know what the 
dates look like, but now we know what the dates look like, you see it. And he said, bullshit more, or whatever he said. Um, you know, this is a, uh, um, you know, this is written in the large script, in the, the Gita large script. On the other hand, but Russians being Russians, everyone, scholars being scholars, they haven't published it yet. They only published the first page because, of course, they want to translate it themselves before they publish it. Yeah. At this rate, it's going to take, you know, 200 years or something before. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think that probably took a rather long time to, to, to work out. Um, what have I lost? Oh, this is just went to Zaitsev. This guy. Uh, this is uh, also another, even though you might think this is a pretty recondite sort of field that nobody could possibly be interested, actually there's quite a lot of bubbling going on, not, not necessarily, you know, um, all discoveries, but it's, it's very interesting. Uh, this uh, professor called Bloch, Francois Bloch, is an Arabist. He's a specialist in medieval Arabic, which you might think is about you know, it has nothing to do with Kita, and it has nothing to do with Kita. But he was doing a very detailed modern edition of a Arab geographer, or an Arab, who's not only a geographer, he, he sort of wrote about everything. One of the things he was interested in is how different people um, denote the time. You know, do they have 12 hours a day, or do they have 24 hours a day, or do they have 10 days a week, or, you know, all this sort of thing. And when he's travelling around, he says, oh, in, in this particular place they use the, the 12 animals to designate time, and this, and this is how they pronounce it. And this particular place they use the 12 animals to designate time, and this is how they pronounce it. And then he came across something which he couldn't quite work out, because about half of them were Mongol, and the other half where well, he had no idea. But then he had a, a sort of an inspiration. So he wrote to me and he said, what do you think they are? And I said, my God. Or whatever Australian is for Bojimoy, you know. <laughs> What's Australian for Bojimoy, doesn't it? The only ones I can think of are not very decent. Um, you know, th what he had discovered by accident were the Kitan words of the 12 animals, which is not what anybody was expecting. But what is exciting about this is that what people had reconstructed from within the language itself, the 12 animals, they already had 11. Okay, so now we know all 12 animals. But again, to quote our friend Nishida, you know, you think you've understood something and then you realise you haven't, that there is one word for mori, which everybody thought, if anything is, is you know, accurate in this sort of stuff, it's just mori is a Mongolian word for horse, and it's m something, r something, so an r, Mongol word for horse. But then some people thought there's something wrong here because there's also a Turkish title called Irigan, which is IR, so it's not R I, it's I R. And then people wrote to and fro about this. But what this fellow found out is that the um, Mongolian, no, that the Kitan word for horse is not Modi, but it's Ri. And some people reconstructed that from within the language. So even though it looked like Mongolian, and some people thought, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe not. This guy was able to show through the writings of some 11th century Arab geographer who wrote down what he heard. And the other thing that got me terribly excited was the word hagadas, because hagadas is the word for tiger in this, um, you know, the 12 animals. And it looks like nothing, because the Mongolian word is baos, and the Manchu word or the Jochu word is tasca. Haga, but Hagan, of course, is the same as Khan, which is Khan, so Alas means something. That maybe it doesn't, it's a taboo word, which means something like king of the animals. Um, and why did they have a taboo word? Maybe because the tiger was a taboo amongst certain ketans, or maybe all ketans, or what have you. So that's why we have this very strange word, not only attested in texts from the far northeast of China, but also from what is now Kazakhstan or this sort of place. So, you know, it's just, again, if you like detective novels, you know, something which appears to have no relevance whatsoever, but it's just in the background there, you know, it's, it's just not as you a bit. Okay, this is just a little um, illustration of a boy about, what, how old is he, seven, eight, I suppose, 
And this little story from uh, from a Chinese ambassador. When Chinese children first in sorry, when Kitan children first learn to read, they first invert the order of the words in accordance with the language. When I was serving as ambassador to the Jin State, my companion was Wang Pu. Every time he gave me an example of Kitan, it made me laugh. For example, when they read Yao Yao Su Zhu Zhu Zhong Shu, Sun Qiao Yue Xiaman, a bird rests on a tree in the middle of a pond, a monk beats the door under the moon. They say, moon bright in monk door hits, water bottom in tree on, do- on crow sits, something like that. So he thought this is weird, you know. But of course, anybody who knows about these things says, ah, I'll take, you know, that this can be translated word for word into Mongolian. So it was quite clear about what sort of grammar the language had. But the Chinese sort of didn't uh, tweak to this because they didn't, they thought, they just translated literally. So birds sit on bridge or whatever, rather than... But anyway, that's a little picture of a tomb which is a little boy learning how to, how to learn his kitan. Whatever happened to the kitan? So a lot of popular books about this because as we saw from our first or second slide, it was a very, very large area and a very, very powerful country. But it disappeared. There just aren't any kitans anymore. What happened to them? And nobody really knows, but there are a few theories around the place. One of which is the Dagwas. Now, the Dagwas are a special lot of people who speak a, a Mongolian-type language, but they're surrounded with Tungus-type languages. In other words, so it's a very aberrant sort of Mongolian language. But amongst their creation myth, or amongst their national myth, or what have you, there are two versions to do with the Kitans. One is that they are descended from the Kitans. The other is that they have always been Dagwas, but after the civil wars and so on, with the refugees fleeing, and after the Jin invasion and so on and so on, very large numbers of Kitans took refuge in that area, which is up near Siberia somewhere, it's in the middle of nowhere. But nobody really knows. This is just you know, sort of what um, you know people talk about. Um, so nobody could prove it. Then, I'm sure everybody's amazement. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, news got out that a group of people in Yunnan, which is about as far away from the Dagos as you could get and still be in China, um, claimed that they were descended from the Kitans, and in fact they were the 15th generation of a particular Kitan general called Usuru, who had come to that area with the Mongol armies of Genghis Khan. So it's well known that in Yunnan there are several groups of uh, Mongols real Mongols, who do their Mongolian thing with, you know, wrestling and archery and so on and so on. Um, so various experts went off to this place and they weren't particularly interested in their claims, but they wanted to know what their language was like. And their language was nothing like it, it should be, okay, because it should be a sort of Altaic language and it was more like a, a Southeast Asian, like Thai or this sort of, this sort of language. So that the thing just stay there. The question just say there, until 10 years ago, when a, a tomb was discovered, they excavated, and there was the body of a woman there, which was a body. Usually they buried, they, they cremated their bodies and but to, you know, put them in, in pots or what have you. Uh, and nobody, people immediately said, ah, oh, shaman, it must be some sort of a shaman. Uh, and it probably is some sort of shaman, but the Ketans had a particular role in society of somebody called the Red Woman. And what exactly the Red Woman did was sort of, not exactly a shaman who, who would jump up and down and um, talk to the spirits, uh, but sort of give advice when necessary. And she would sit in a corner and every now and then she'd say, you know, this is what I think and so on. That doesn't matter. What does matter is that she was a genuine Ketan and that there was enough DNA in her body to be able to identify her as a Kitan. So to cut a long story short, they then compared the DNA with the Yunnan knot and the DNA with the Dago knot, and they found indeed that there was a much higher proportion of DNA than one would expect in those groups. So it doesn't really prove anything, but it gives a very good indication of, um, of uh, that there's something in it, this story. And it, it's just, uh, a very quick minute. Um, very recently, a week or so ago, I got a, an invitation to attend a conference on Ketan studies in Yunnan 
It's like ketan studies that you know what's all this about. And it turns out to be sponsored by the, you know, whatever it is, Tourism Bureau. Um, so they want to, <laughs> they want to, you know, come and have a look at a genuine ketan or something. Anyway, I don't particularly want to go to China in January. Um, but uh, there's still something bubbling away there. Possibly read, that was the, the Red Lady. That was what I just said there. Kita Nard script, we talked about that already. This is the area where the imperial tombs are. And so for those of you into feng shui, that's more as, as it is. It's a, a natural sort of barrier. And in the old days, of course, there was a, a guard, you know, a heavily fortified sort of gate there. But it was because the whole thing fell apart at the end of the Qing Dynasty that the peasants and anybody else could go in there. Anyway, it was a very beautiful, very beautiful area. That is what a tomb looks like, or I should say the entrance to a tomb looks like. As you can see, it's dug into the side of the mountainside. And um, do you know how people find these things, by the way? Use your imagination. Grave robbers, because they're very good at <laughs> they're very good at this sort of thing. And over the many lunches I've had in that part of the world, one was quite, or many were quite amazing. But um, one had to do with a, uh, I think it was the head of police, the head of the archaeological bureau, a couple of grave robbers, and so on. anyway, they, they, they were all, they were all the best of mates because, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> anyway, you can imagine, you know, you all you all know what it's like. Hang on, what I'm pushing the one button. Oh yeah, that's another one. And as you can see, you dig into the. The, the mountain side and then there's a door. This is a rather upmarket sort of death mask. The aristocracy, it's very strange, they would cremate their dead but then they would have wooden mannequins, they would have wooden statues and then they'd put the ashes of the person inside the wooden statues and then they'd put the clothing of the person there and put a death mask on his face. Isn't that amazing? So they were able to produce reproduce the general appearance of what the person looked like, whereas he was really, um, he was really, uh, you know, cremated and inside a little... Anyway, that's a very, very elegant. I bought a copy of that for about, I don't know, 100 yuan or something. I'm very happy with it. That's my own version of Memento Mori, you know. <laughs> um, Okay, this is just an interesting little map. Liao is sort of all over the place. But these areas which you see are dots are where people have found tombs. And you can see this is Nanjing, which this is Beijing, which is just beneath the, the Great Wall. Anyway, you can see there's quite a lot of archaeological um, activity going on there. If you look at that carefully, you won't make any sense of it. Uh, because this again is in the large script and it's been copied by somebody. Uh, and again, it looks pretty much as if it were Chinese, um, except it doesn't make any sense and a lot of characters look like Chinese, but a lot don't. So it's still one of those, still one of those mysteries of, of the script. Um, this one, because this, this talk was going to be much longer, I walked by one stage and then various friends said, nah, too long and so on. But that is, a, that is an example of the Jurchen script that I've mentioned from time to time. Uh, and as you can see, it's sort of rather similar to the Kita Nard script, but not really. Um, you know, this means year, which is also... Anyway, that some of the characters are the same as other scripts. Most of the characters aren't. Which is a question is where did this come from? Where did the Gita Lard script come from? Where did all these scripts come from? And again, getting back to my friend Yucha, the fellow who said, you know, there's a possibility that this might be translatable. Um, he came up with another idea that this was a sort of a, a colloquial, non-official way of writing Chinese under the non-Chinese, you know, sort of a shorthand sort of thing. Something like Niu Shu, any you know women's writing and so on and so on, but that's purely a guess on his part. Still, nobody knows where where all these uh, scripts look like. This is on the outer suburbs, I suppose, of the capital city. The capital city was called Shangjing, the supreme capital, and now it's called uh, 
Swani Bachi. And every now and then you see the something which happens to be um, still survived. That's another one. I suspect he may have been knocked down and he's been put up again. This one, if you look over on... Somebody's worked it out. There's a rather confused and not very pleased amateur archaeologist there sort of doing this. Um, and the reason I'm not very happy is you can see what the, the earth is like. It's sort of pretty muddy. And so the mud had sort of got into my shoes and was all squishing away. And, um, but if you want to be an archaeologist, that's what you have to do, apparently. And there I was. I can't remember if that was part of um, And there's me and a couple of other people standing on what is left of the city wall of the Shangjin. And it's not really very big, in fact. It's oh, the size of a football ground or something, probably smaller. So it wasn't a big capital city by any means. OK, 10 cents for anybody who can guess what that is. You're obviously rich, you don't. <laughs> uh, I'll show you what it used to look like until about 1920-something. What do you think that is? It's a statue of Guan Yin. But what happened during the Russian Civil War is a lot of white Russian soldiers were taking refuge in that area and they were bored out of their minds and probably quite drunk. And so they used, they used the head of Guan Yin as rifle practice. So they spent their days shooting off her head. And so they, you've got this rather obscure looking bit of stone. And it's only that somebody happened to keep a, a picture, you know, dating from 1920 something, which, um, which uh, you know, looks like a, just another picture of what the kid hunts. Look, I rather like this guy to another mean-looking guy that you wouldn't want to tangle with. This is what the inside of the tomb looks like, or the tombs. Remember we said this is the door, and you open the door, and you go inside, and blah. Um, I've got a, a better picture here, but this is the, the tombstone with an inscription on it. And this is, uh, you know, just some decoration and what have you. I rather like her just because I like her. She's sort of you know, terribly conscientious and terribly busy and she's some sort of, I don't know, why she is a servant girl or something. Now, isn't this just the most wonderful thing you've ever seen? Um, it looks like, you know, somebody had a jolly good party and didn't clean up, and so sort of closed the door and <laughs> what have you. But that's, when they opened the door, that's what they found. And it really does look as if it was, you know, last night's party. And if we look underneath the table, we can see again the... Um, the tombstone, and the tombstone has around it the 12 uh, zodiacal animals. And you can't see very clearly on this one, but basically the tombstones, there's something like, uh, this one is probably not very important, so a bit less than a metre, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.8 of a metre. And you have the inscription saying, this is so-and-so, and, -so and you know, he was the son of such and such, such and such, and he married so and so, and they had six children, and then they did this. And all that can be understood because it's all pretty, um, all pretty stereotyped, I suppose, you know. But then we get to the real Ketan bit of what exactly he did, and then nobody can understand it, which will almost lead to the conclusion of this talk. But that's rather nice, you see, of, uh, you know, this. Um, party of, I don't know, what are they, olives, do you think, or something like that? This is a little human thing. These are watermelons, which uh, the deceased took with him to the grave. And this I rather like, because we're used to talking about Mongolian hot pot, but here's a picture of a ketan hot pot. So I'm, I'm running a sort of a, a little campaign at the moment to have it renamed a ketan hot pot. <laughs> <laughs> and you also notice, by the way, they're crazy haircuts. Um, and they, they all look like that. They've all got the hair cut at the top and sort of dangling down the, the front or the side. I put here the last ketan. No, I don't want to put the extra slides. I don't have to. I, I just mentioned about these people in Yunnan. 
this chip might be dead by now because this picture is uh, about 20 years old. But this is the patriarch of the Yunnan ketones who claims to be a direct descendant of a particular ketone general. And that's why they're now holding something sponsored by the uh, uh, Tourism Bureau of, of, of Yunnan or, or whatever it is. Okay, we'll leave it at that stage. I'm a quarter of an hour overdue. Um, we can have Q. I don't know if you're going to get too many A or not, but we can, <laughs> we can try.